<laughs> I have um, Kat on the call with me and I'm really excited to bring her on the screen. But before that, I have to say she is probably the highest profile surface designer I have um, on this Facebook Live. I'm really, really excited um, to bring her on the call. Um, she is a top teacher on Skillshare. She has just released her 20th class yesterday. Um, and I think that's amazing. Um, she is a top earner on Society6. She's a world traveler, an entrepreneur, a speaker, a writer, and so much, much more. So right now, I'm actually blushing while I'm saying this because like, I'm so excited and nervous at the same time. But Kat and I have been talking behind the scene just to see if our text um, working and she's the nicest person so she's put me at ease um, and I see there are some comments um, already on the um, video so I'm gonna bring Kat in now okay can everyone see Kat? Kat do a wave they can see you now good morning everyone hello everyone thank you for coming cool so I want to um, everyone saying that they love your hair <laughs> um, I want to start off with how many countries have you visited and have you ever been to Australia oh man I have not been to Australia I was in New Zealand last year and it was epic but um, yeah I guess I've been to airports in Australia but uh, not yet um, countries in total uh, probably somewhere between 30 and 40 a few years ago, my goal was to make it to 30 countries by the time I turned 30. And I know I surpassed that goal, so it's somewhere in the range of 30 to 40. Oh, wow. That's insane. Uh, do you miss home sometimes? I do. I do. Um, usually, I go. my home is actually Kansas in the United States. And so my parents are there, my brother and his wife and their new baby are there, a bunch of friends. So now that I'm actually, I'm actually in Mexico right now, Playa del Carmen, which is really nice because Cancun is a direct flight from Kansas City. So I've been able to go back home a few times. I've been in Mexico since October. So it's nice to be one, you know, three hour flight away from home instead of a 30 hour journey from home, which is usually what it is because I spend most of my time in Southeast Asia. So it's been a nice refreshing break to be uh, in the same time zone as you know, all of my meetings that I'm having, except for you, you're Australia, so I guess I'm on the wrong end for this one. <laughs> yep. Um, so I'm going to start with the questions. I'm going to try and cap this um, interview to an hour, um, just because it's 6.30 on your side. <laughs> We're being very mindful about that. So how long have you been a surface designer? I've been a surface designer since 2014, um, but actually I didn't even know what that term was until several years later. So I was doing surface design and art licensing before I really even knew what it was. So, and, and to even explain that a little bit, the reason why that is, is because I was getting involved with art licensing and surface design while I was still working a full-time job as an art director at a design agency in Kansas City. So in my free time, I was uploading designs to print on demand websites like Society6 and Redbubble and kind of building up an income on the side that way. And I didn't even know what the term was. I'm like, oh, I'm an artist that puts her work on print on demand sites, but I didn't know what licensing was. I didn't know what surface design was. So I've been doing it since 2014, but didn't even realize that's what it was until um, probably 2016. Well, you've really kind of briefly told us about how you started. I was like, that was my next question. Um, ah. When you first started in Society6, how many designs did you list on Society6 before seeing a reasonable return of investment? Yeah, I actually pulled up my Society6 um, earnings because I anticipated that you may ask this question. It happens in interviews from time to time. Um, so, okay, so month one, and this is this is back in 2014. So the first month uh, that I was involved with Society6, I sold three products and I made $9.20. And for me, like honestly, it was that first sale. It was a phone case and it was just absolutely astonishing for me because I never knew that you could actually make money as an artist. Again, I was working as an art director at an agency. That's what I went to school for. That's what my career was. So the idea of repurposing the paintings that I was doing just from home for fun into something that was earning me even a few dollars was just 
I mean, it was just mind blowing. And so that first month when I made, you know, nine bucks selling three products, I was just like, oh my God, this is, this is huge. Um, even though by month two, I'm looking at the numbers, I sold 17 products and I made a little over a hundred dollars. And then, so the first few months it was, um, you know, it was, it was good money. But then by the time it got to month six, I sold just shy of a thousand products and I made $4,781. So at that point, by month six on, this is just Society6, it wasn't everything combined, it was just this one uh, POD site. So yeah, by month six, I was definitely making more a month than my full-time job. So, you know, I'm seven years in at this point and, you know, the average is, it's gone high, it's gone low, but the average for months is around $5,000 a month right now with Society6. Wow, that is pretty amazing. And you've got about 1,006, did I write that somewhere? 1,006 or 1,009 designs up in Society6 right now. Oh, I didn't even know that was the number. I mean, I know there's a lot. <laughs> How often did you actually upload designs up on Society6? You know, I've been doing it consistently for the last, what did I say, seven years, 2014. So it's been, you know, it's been fairly consistent over the years. Um, you know, people ask me what's my, uh, you know, how, what's my schedule for uploading and what I try to do is, you know, if I could do one upload a day or maybe a handful a week, that would be pretty good. And I know for a lot of artists that sounds completely overwhelming. So it's like, how do you create so much artwork? And one of the tricks to that is for every one design that I create, I'll create like five to 10, sometimes even 15 different colorways. So it's not just like, oh, I actually, here's my sticker on my water bottle, if you can see it. So it's this panda design I made. And what I did is like, this is the original in orange. Um, it's printed on a transparent kiss cut sticker. So it's, you know, it's like hard to see. But yeah, with this one sticker, I also did red, green, blue, purple, pink, and then was able to have all of those be separate designs. So each one of those is a completely separate upload on Society6. And then I'll span it out over, you know, maybe four months. So it's not just like a bunch of pandas all in a row. Row, it can be like one panda and then a bunch of other things and then the second color variation of that same artwork. So when you see like thousands of designs that I've uploaded on Society6, keep in mind that a lot of that is just color variations, which is actually a really good trick if you're interested in surface design or print on demand. Creating color variations is a really fantastic way to add some diversity to your portfolio without having to, you know, reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Um, that's great. Last week, or we, I had a call with another surface designer. Her name is Erin Candle. She's Australian too. She's a top owner on Spoonflower, and that's exactly what she did. She does. She's got three thousand designs on that platform, but she has one design in lots of different colorways, and there's are multiple listings, and that's how she maximizes the design up on that platform for her. Um, do you have any work on any other POD platforms aside from Society6? Yeah, I do. So when, you know, way back in 2014, when I saw that there was this massive potential for earnings with Society6, I decided to basically do the shotgun approach and find as many similar companies as I possibly could and then set up shops on those companies as well. So, you know, things have fluctuated a little bit over the years, but Redbubble has been pretty consistent with me. They're my number two. Um, they're not earning me $5,000 a month. It's closer to around $1,000 a month. So it's, you know, there's a big, there's a big difference there, but it's still been consistent earnings for me for the past seven years. And Redbubble, I think, actually, I think they're um, headquartered out of Australia. So yeah, um, that's pretty cool for you. Um, yeah, so Redbubble is a great one. Um, I also got involved with Casetify back in maybe 2015 and sold a lot of phone cases through them. Um, at the time, they were a really great uh, brand for me to partner with because they actually got me some celebrity collections. So they did a Hillary Duff collection in which she picked out one of my designs. And then that's awesome for me because then I get to have my brand affiliated with Hillary Duff. Uh, they did the same thing with Lucy Hale, who was the actress on Pretty Little Liars. So they, you know, brought a lot of great opportunities my way in terms of celebrity endorsements and celebrity collaborations. Um, ones that I'm getting into now, Mixtiles, they're a new print-on-demand company and they've actually been pretty promising for me. So they're, they're looking pretty good. I just got involved with them at the end of last year. So we'll see how it um, all nets out, but they've been really fantastic. Um, 
And then just to you know, caveat this, not all print-on-demand companies are earning me thousands of dollars a month. Really, the the only two that are act, like actively doing that right now are Redbubble and Society6. Mixed Styles is getting up there; like they're they're looking pretty promising. But then you know, I also have designs on T Public, and I'm earning like I don't know, ten to twenty dollars a month through them. And then some print-on-demands I'm working with, I'm earning like a dollar or two a month. So. You know, it's not not every print on demand company is going to be perfect for every artist. A lot of it depends on the style of artwork you have and then what kind of audience that specific company is curating. So, um, yeah, to try to find a match that way. And a really good way to see that is to look at um, their Instagram pages, see how they market themselves. Are they looking, um, are they trying to be like trendy and apl like applying to millennials? Are they a little bit more, um, you know, sophisticated and older? I mean, there's, there's totally different audiences for every single print-on-demand company. So, you know, my artwork does really well on Society6. It does not do well on TeePublic whatsoever because my design style just doesn't suit their products or their audience. I've heard that um, even though Society6 and Redbubbles are really similar, they have a different target market. So um, what sells on Society6 may not sell so much on Redbubble and vice versa. Yeah, you know what, Redbubble, like my bread and butter in terms of earnings from them, like, and I mentioned it's around like a thousand a month, is actually stickers, which, I mean, my profit margin on a sticker is like 50 cents, but the fact that they sell so many stickers, I mean, that's what's earning most of my profit. So it's lowest like actual um, earnings rate that you'll get per product on their entire website because stickers are so inexpensive. But when you sell so many and Redbubble really markets stickers really well, then it can make a really big difference. Mm. Bex asking, did you find you had to tweak tags or places to market your art in order to get more traffic or people to buy your stuff? You know, yeah, I think tags are really important. And so um, if you're watching this right now and you're not sure what that means, it's a keyword tag. So when you're uploading your artwork to something like Society6 or Redbubble, you'll have an opportunity to put the title of your piece in and then put um, some keyword tags that you want to use and then maybe a brief description of what the artwork is. So I usually skip the description because I'm a little bit lazy, but keyword tags are really important. So I'll, you know, keyword tag the colors that are in the design. Um, if it's, okay, actually I'll just do it for this. Okay, so it's the panda. So I would keyword tag, you know, panda, Asia, China, bamboo, cute, floral, flowers, pandas, like just a, as many variations as I could of anything that relates to this artwork that somebody might feasibly search for when they're looking for a particular design. Okay. Amber's asking, can you increase your margin this, um, of the stickers on Redbubble? Um, she's read that uh, it can help, but that, but then your stickers are priced a bit higher, so it can be a trade-off. Yeah, you know what? I I think I found a happy range on Redbubble. Oh, God, I should check. I think it's around 10 or 20 percent. So um, with most, actually across the board with print-on-demand companies, 10 percent royalties is industry average. So what that means is, okay, this is my phone case and it's from Society6 and I think it costs $35 on Society6, which means I earn $3.50 if somebody buys this phone case. So a lot of artists that um, aren't yet involved in print on demand, they hear those numbers and they just think, oh my God, that's such a ripoff for the artist only making $3.50. But when it comes down to it, uh, these companies are handling so much more um, on their end. So they're doing the web hosting, they're doing marketing and advertising. They're the ones creating the products, um, shipping with different warehouses, um, sending the products to customers, handling tech support, customer support handling returns. It's basically, they handle all of the things that as an artist, I, I really don't want to do. I want to focus on the thing that I can uniquely do well, which is create artwork that's going to sell well. So um, yeah, 10% is pretty industry average with print on demand companies. And that's actually higher than what I earn um, with my in-store sales, with my in-store licensing, like with Target or Urban Outfitters, it's actually lower than 10%. But um, this is a really long answer to the question, which is, can you adjust your rates on Redbubble? And the answer is yes, you absolutely can. So Redbubble is one of the uh, few print-on-demand companies where you can adjust your own royalty rates. So with Society6, I know you can change the rates on art prints and framed art prints, but with all of their other products, it's static pricing, so it remains the same. And then with Redbubble, you're actually able to decide your own royalty rate. So I could say that I mean, I could say that this sticker costs $50 and I would probably earn like $48.50 off of that, but nobody would buy a sticker that costs $50. So um, it's, it's kind of this balancing game where you wanna look 
at what other artists are setting their prices at, and then try to meet somewhere in the middle. And so if you put a, a really high value on your artwork to sell as art prints, um, you know, by all means do it, but just know that if you're having your art prints or your stickers or whatever cost a lot more than somebody else, you're going to lower the chances of somebody actually buying that product because they're going to see it alongside a lot of cheaper products. So you don't want to be the cheapest one, you don't want to be the most expensive one, but you want to find a nice balance there. Yeah, I, I was smiling at this comment, I have to read it out to you. Uh, it's from Trish Barnard and she says, I'm old enough to be Kat's grandma, but man, she's my hero. What a rock star, brilliant lady. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so sweet. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, Erin's um, asking, how did you decide which styles to heavily market within your skill range? Mm. So when I was first getting started, I actually tried a lot of different styles. And so I did watercolor, especially water, uh, watercolor botanicals. I tried doing these like digital collages with different textures that I downloaded online. And then I did some pen and ink drawings with uh, India Ink and a Stylus. And out of those three styles, watercolor, digital collages, and then India Ink, um, watercolor got a lot of traction. So I decided, okay, um, I'm just gonna put the digital collages and the hand-drawn stuff on back burner, and I'm just gonna really focus on watercolor because that's what was getting the most traction and was selling the best. So, you know, I, I get this question from artists a lot of, how important is it to develop a, dis a really distinct style? And that is important to really develop your artist voice, but that doesn't mean you're just stuck to one medium or one specific type of motif. I mean, I paint with watercolor, I do digital illustrations in Adobe Illustrator, I draw on my iPad using the app Procreate, but um, you know, what holds everything together is within all of these different mediums, I have a pretty distinct style. So the way that I you know, characterize animals, uh, the way that I paint with white space in mind, these are kind of this, this aspects of my artistic voice that hold it together in my portfolio. So when you're first getting started, um, it's, it's not a bad idea to try a lot of different styles or as many styles as you're comfortable working with and then seeing what's getting the, the most traction and then kind of continuing along that vein. And honestly, that's how I approach most aspects of my business. You know, if even the online education stuff, I did one class just thinking it was going to be a one and done class for Skillshare. Um, and then it, it, I really enjoyed doing it, one. And two, I built up this massive following on Skillshare and I was like, okay, you know what? That actually went pretty well. Let's go ahead and give it a go again and just see what happens. And then, you know, fast forward, here I am four years later and I have 20 classes now. So. Um, yeah, it's it's even in my in my business today, I'm always trying out new things, just kind of taking like little dabbling experiments, seeing what's viable, what's not viable, what's not viable, and kind of seeing what I want to actually move forward with. So when you're getting, you know, your print on demand company going or you're getting kind of your artwork out there for the world to see it, um, it's not a bad idea to kind of start painting with a broad brush and then narrow it down as you go. Okay. Oh, the questions are coming fast and furious, Kat. Um, I'm gonna. Try. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be faster. <laughs> There's gonna be like uh, lots of um, questions, so I'm gonna pick and choose some questions just because we do have some questions um, for Kat already. So, um, Tammy's asking, do you order samples of products before you sell them on the sites? What I'll usually do is if I'm working with a new print-on-demand company, before I promote it to my audience, I'll order like maybe one or two things just to make sure that the quality looks good. And, um, but I don't do that for every single product they have. I mean, Society6, I think they have like, I mean, it's over a hundred products at this point. They even have furniture. Um, but what I'll do is I'll order, you know, a handful of products, just see, you know, if I like the printing style, the quality, it's a two for one because I'll order the products and then I'll photograph them for my portfolio and have a good marketing piece. And then I'll also have an opportunity to do kind of a, a quality check and see what they look like. But for the most part, I, I don't worry about that too much. I mean, I've ordered Redbubble stuff. I mean, over the last seven years, I've probably ordered maybe 10 things. And same with Society6, maybe 10 or 15 things um, over the last seven years. Um, you know, Spoon, I know Spoonflower is a really popular print on demand site as well. I have a shop set up there, but I actually don't have anything activated because I've never ordered product samples from them, which I know is something you have to do in order to be able to actually sell your design. And I mean, for me, it's just like, I'm never in the United States when I'm thinking, oh, I should order a product sample. So like the timing just never works out. 
but um, yeah, it's, I think that's mostly a personal preference. But you can also, if you don't want to spend money on ordering samples of your own work, you can always look up their product reviews and see what other people are saying. And that gives you a really good picture as well. If everyone's just completely bashing on the quality of the throw pillows, maybe no, maybe no like this is not something I want to actually promote. Which by the way, none of my print on demand companies I work with have bad quality throw pillows. I'm just using that as an example. But um, yeah, you can always kind of look it up online to make sure that you feel comfortable with what your artwork is being printed on. Yep, that's a great one. Are there any drawbacks about selling on POD sites? Yeah, so I mentioned that the um, the royalty rate is 10% and I know a lot of artists that are new to print on demand get a little, you know, like, oh my god, that's so low, but I already addressed that. So that's, that's one thing to mention is the, uh, the royalty rate. Um, and then licensing in store is usually about half that. So I see one of the questions, someone was asking if um, it's still a good time to get involved with print on demands like Society6. So like I mentioned, I got involved way back in 2014 and it was a really optimal time because it wasn't yet that oversaturated of a market in terms of um, content creators like me. So it was really the perfect time to get involved and that's been reflected over the last seven years because I started out at a really good place with them and you know it's it's I've grown with them as a company but yeah it, it is a lot harder to see that kind of success with society six and really a lot of print on demand companies now because they are really popular it's it's a guaranteed way for artists to make money and a lot of artists are taking advantage of that which which you should so yeah that you're not going to see those same numbers in you know, with Society6 now if you're just getting started because there are so many artists involved in the platform. But one thing you can do to kind of work around that is there are new print-on-demand companies opening on, like every day. I mean, there's so many new ones and a lot of them will probably fail, but some of them are going to be really successful and earn you a lot of money. So um, my best advice at this point is getting involved with new ones that are popping up, like do some research, find out um, is there some new print on demand company that a lot of people are talking about. Mixed Tiles is one that I mentioned. They're new as of last year and they've been doing exceptionally well for me because they don't have that many artists on the platform yet. So that's my numbers with them are probably going to change as more artists get involved. But honestly, that's just how it works with print on demand. So strike while the iron's hot. Yeah, good advice. Now you have uh, some really big retailers under your belt like Target and Urban Outfitters. How did they um, find you? Did they reach out to you or did you have to pitch I tried there? pitching my work to a lot of companies and I was a failure at that. I mean, I never got any successful gigs out of, out of pitching my work because when I was pitching my stuff, I didn't know what a call to action was so i never asked for anything i wasn't like i would just like send over a bunch of examples and then not be like okay license these for x amount royalty rate i was just like send them artwork and then have absolutely no follow-up so um, i'm not really good at sales in that term so where i found success was being available for companies to reach out to me so all over my social media my website um, my online shop you find my contact info everywhere so it's really easy just to copy and paste my email address um, and then shoot me a quick email if you're interested in licensing something and that's how it worked with Urban Outfitters with my uh, first collaboration with them so it was actually they were the first big in-store brand that I ever licensed with up until that point I was only doing print-on-demand website uh, work and I remember I got their email when I was in um, LA, I was at LAX about to fly to Tokyo and I got this email right before I was going through security and it was from a buyer at Urban Outfitters and she was interested in licensing my design. It's, it says good vibes and it's just um, like this hand done brush lettering and she wanted to license it for art prints in Urban Outfitters and I was just like, I mean, I, I completely freaked out. It was just like, oh my God, oh my God, it's Urban Outfitters. I was, I'm pretty sure I like screamed a little bit and I mean, I was going through security. It was the worst timing possible. I had to do additional screening and everything. But um, yeah, that whole flight to Tokyo, I just like opened up the notes section of my phone and I was kind of like writing and rewriting my response to be the perfect response to act like, oh, I do this all the time, um, but it really it was my first in-store gig, so I was just like, I, I just didn't even know how these things work, so I was just kind of making it up as I went along, and it turned out to be a really effective partnership. And now, I mean, I'm basically licensing them, I think, with, for four years now, so I do about one or two collections a year, and um, 
yeah, so they reached out to me because they found me, I think they either found me on Instagram or they found me on Society6 first and then saw my, um, my contact info. Actually, that's something I wanna mention as well. So if you're putting your artwork on websites like Society6 or Redbubble or Spoonflower, whatever it is, that's a really good opportunity to um, have your artwork be available for scouters to come find it, right? So um, a lot of the, uh, the stuff that I have on Society6, um, other companies actually kind of like browse through Society6 and will reach out to me about using a specific design because they find it on Society6 first. So kind of, kind of in one way you can look at print on demand companies as like a Google image search engine for the companies used to find artwork to license. So, um, you know, Deny Designs, uh, this is how it works with them. So Deny Designs, it's a wholesale company that's part of Society6. And so what they do is they look for the cream of the crop of Society6 artwork. I mean, these, these two brands are affiliated, Society6 and Deny. And what Deny does is they pull, you know, the designs that they think they have the best potential. And then they message the artists that are involved in Society6 and they're like, hey, we want to actually put this in Target or put this in Urban Outfitters or Home Goods or whatever it is. Um, and actually pull it off of Society6 to do an exclusive license with Target. And so of course, you know, for all of those, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's definitely do it because that for the brand affiliation alone, like that's, that's completely worth it to me. I wanna be working with Target, Urban Outfitters, all of those brands because it makes my brand look better. Yeah. FYI, I love that you said that you fail at pitching because I want everyone to know, everyone knows in this, group knows how hard it is to just pitch to art directors and everyone fails like it's so normal to hear a no it's so normal to be ghosted and if someone like you can say like i suck at <laughs> pitching my work oh my god that's just you know hope for us there is hope for everyone yeah you don't have to be good at um at sales and pitching and I, I certainly am not but i'm good at being available and having my artwork in a place where a lot of people can see it so um and actually now it's a little bit different because i signed on with an art licensing agency i think back in 2018 and so now they're going out on my behalf and finding new partnerships and opportunities to license my work which is awesome because i'd kind of you know i built this this licensing company on my own since 2014 but I'd really kind of hit a plateau in terms of I mean you can you can only get so far if you have this you know this this lack of something that you're able to do with your with your business and so for me because I knew I, I just I couldn't sell I couldn't pitch to companies for me the the solution there was find someone that can and let them do it on your behalf and that in my in my example worked out with hiring a, an agency it's a dual branding and licensing those are my agents so they represent me now great when um has any companies asked you to remove a design from society six uh to be used on their products yeah that's really common actually and I, I usually don't have a problem doing it so um with target for example so target wants exclusivity which their target, they can ask for anything and they're probably going to get it because everybody wants to be in target. So they want exclusivity, which means if my art prints of donuts are sold in target, I can't sell that exact same art print anywhere else. But um, you as an artist, you actually have some power here. So um, you can define what that exclusivity means. So with target, um, you know, I think the contract started out with just like general exclusivity. They get this design for I think it was like five years or something. And so I came back at them and I was like, okay, um, I'm cool with the exclusivity, but let's make it exclusive by product. So I can still sell the donuts on phone cases and apparel and literally everything else that's not in art print, but you get exclusivity on art prints. And um, that's, they, people will, I mean, companies will always agree to this because it's, it's fair. Um, and then another thing that you can do with exclusivity is you can define the territory. So. With Target, it's they don't get this worldwide license to use my donuts, but they do get a license in the US and Canada to use my donuts. So I can still sell the donuts on art prints in Japan or in Germany, just as long as it's not infringing on the, the territory that we defined with them. Um, yeah, so just know that if you hear exclusivity, I know a lot of people kind of freak out when they hear that, and I, I definitely used to as well, but you, you actually have some wiggle room there. So you can give them exclusivity. Oh, and then one more thing, uh, definitely put a term, like a time limit on it. So 
Don't ever give someone exclusivity indefinitely because that means you'll never be able to use that artwork on anything else. You let them know like, okay, this is two years exclusive or this is five years exclusive or you know, you can meet in the middle for what works for them. But um, this is something, something that all companies, all good companies will agree to as well as putting an actual timestamp on that. Yeah. Do you ever sell your work outright? You know, I don't sell originals and the reason is it's not like, oh, they're precious and I have to hang on to them. It's just that I'm traveling all the time and I don't want to have to figure out shipping logistics. And um, I actually, I, I never really figured out how I should price my originals. So I know a lot of artists that, I mean, they're, they make a lot of money just by selling originals. And um, that's, I, for people that can find a way to make that work, that's awesome. I just, I just never really figured out pricing for that. And also the, for me, what works really well is finding some sort of recurring revenue stream. So what that means is by putting my stuff um, in Target or Urban Outfitters, those shops are open and, and they're selling my stuff even when I'm you know, sleeping or taking a bath. They don't have to be that active with it. But when you're selling originals, um, yeah, you've got you've to like pack it up, ship it, deal with the customer support, all those things, um, which isn't a bad thing. It's just something that I wasn't interested in doing. Yeah. Sorry, I think when I meant by outright, it means that um, there's another term for it. I think I'm using uh, probably the Australian term, but it means giving them the full copyright for it. So that's exclusive and then non-exclusive. And then the outright means they're buying the full um, designs um, and the whole copyright uh, for a higher fee. Do you, would you do that? I would almost never do that. Uh, the only times that I'll give someone a copyright is if um, I used to do freelance design and I did logos and branding. So of course, when you're designing a logo for a company, it's, um, it's understood that once you create that logo and hand it to them, part of the price of that logo is you're transferring the copyright. Um, and that makes sense for a company. They should own their own logo, obviously. But with artwork, I, I've never, and I, I'm, I'm really thinking back. No, I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I've ever wanted to ever sell my copyright. I mean, that's the most valuable thing you have as an artist is you owning the copyright to that piece. Even, even if you're a, a painter and you sell a canvas and you sell the original canvas and it goes in somebody's home, they, they can't make duplicates of that and they can't photograph it and sell it as art prints because they're buying that canvas, but they're not buying the copyright to that piece. So that is your most valuable asset as an artist is continuing to own that copyright. So um, I know it can be kind of confusing exclusivity versus copyright. Exclusivity means you can temporarily use this design in the way that we agreed to in the contract, but um, that's, that's all you can do with it versus so giving someone the copyright means they can do whatever they want with it and they never have to ask your permission. It's um, So yeah, and I have a lot of brands ask me for exclusivity, that's very common, but I don't think anyone's ever asked for outright copyright um, purchase. And if anybody did, if that's ever in the terms and conditions of a new print on demand company that, that pops up, that is a total red flag. You should never ever give away your copyright unless you unless that's your full intention. Yeah. So Toby's asking, have you licensed the same artwork to another company after an exclusive contract is up? Yeah, definitely. So actually one of the uh, the collections that I put together for Mod Cloth, uh, this was I think like back in 2015 or 2016, um, they, they wanted exclusivity for two years and I created um, just a, a bunch of new artwork for them. It was five new designs. And so of course I charged a premium price for that because they're not just pulling designs out of my uh, portfolio that already exist. They're actually commissioning me to create something exclusively for them. So that's gonna come at a much higher price point. That's not just gonna be like, oh, 10%. That's gonna have a flat fee associated with it. So I think in that case, I think I charged like, like 2,500 or maybe 3,000 per design. I would I would raise my prices now, but back then it was just um, was what I was comfortable with. But so what happened was after those um, we did two years exclusive. So after those terms expired, I put a lot of those designs on uh, Society Six. Actually, one of them is in Target right now, and so I've actually made more money since that uh, that contract expired and the licensing that I've done since then than I did with the original contract. So. That's totally fine to do as well. Just uh, make sure that your files are organized and you're not um, releasing a design too early because the last thing you want to do is violate a contract. Yeah. Do you use paid marketing as a way to promote your Society6 shop? No, I wouldn't do it for Society6 just because I don't, I don't own, there's, I don't like have an ownership over anything like that. 
I've done paid, I did paid ads. I boosted a post about a month ago. I put like 20 bucks on it just to get it more visibility. And I hadn't done that in like six years. And I'm like, let's just see what happens if I throw $20 into Facebook. And like, it didn't really do anything. So um, I hired a guy, I think this is like back in like, like five years ago to set up Facebook ads for me and run Facebook ads to my Shopify store because those products um, I do set my own royalty rate on so I have a little bit more ownership over how much I'm earning. Uh, but to be totally honest, like that, it was kind of a bummer. I spent more money on ads than I made in profits. So I've just kind of stepped away from paid advertising and everything that I've grown is, is based off of organic. Yeah, so that would be Instagram on social media platforms. Yeah, I did the paid ads on Facebook, the ones I did about five years ago, and yeah, they they didn't really translate into anything. I don't think I've ever boosted a post on Face or on Instagram, but what I have done is partnered with companies that have used my Instagram account to do some sort of advertisement. So I've done that with Skillshare in the past. Um, they were testing out to see what would happen if instead of them doing all the marketing, they had some of their top teachers uh, market their own classes using paid ads on Instagram. So Skillshare put together an ad for me, ran it through my Instagram account, and um, but I, I didn't pay anything for that. It was just something they wanted to try out. And I was like, yeah, let's let's boost some, some traction on my page, so. Okay, um, that was for Skillshare, was that? Yeah, that was for Skillshare. I That's a question that just came in about um, Skillshare and she's interested to know how profitable are your Skillshare courses for you. It seems like a lot of upfront time commitments. Is it a good return on investment? And she loves the classes that you have. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Skillshare has been Oh my God, it's, it, it literally saved my business in 2020 because when COVID um, was, you know, like first getting going back last March and a lot of, a lot of places around the world were going into lockdowns and quarantines and in-store shopping. I mean, overnight, my, I, I lost probably 50% of my earnings with my in-store art licensing, which used to be the primary way that my business made money. And so I remember like looking at those numbers last March and April and just being like, crap, um, because it was just, it was totally devastating. But then what happened is so many people were stuck at home that uh, a lot of people were taking online classes and wanting to learn new things. And so while my income from art licensing through all these stores that were shut down just completely plummeted, all of my earnings from society or from uh, Skillshare started rising because people were watching online classes. So I was getting paid more money because with Skillshare, the way that they structure their pro uh, their revenue is it's a um, it's a profit share at the end of every month. So they take um, all the money that they earned as a company and then they divvy it up to the teachers based off of minutes watched. So if I had, let's say I had 1% of all of the minutes watched across the entire platform for that month, that means that I'm going to earn 1% of their profits. So it's uh, it's not just like a guaranteed, it's not like, oh, you get $20 per class or you get 10 cents per minute. It fluctuates quite a bit depending on how much they, they earned that month. But yeah, um, Skillshare really, really, I mean, online teaching in general across across the board completely blew up in 2020 and that that trend is not dying anytime soon if anything it's still rising so yeah they are they they've been i mean they they totally saved my ass in 2020 in terms of earning revenue for my business and that's just continuing to rise so at this point i mean i'm still creating artwork i still do do designs every day i just i'm looking at some watercolor blueberries i did yesterday but um yeah i've also dedicated a lot more time to online teaching um, if nothing else, just to diversify my business a little bit. Like if, if COVID taught me anything, it's relying on one revenue stream that can be really dangerous because if that revenue stream dries up for any reason, and it doesn't even have to be your fault. I mean, COVID who, who could have predicted that, but, um, it, it totally ate into my art licensing, but luckily I had uh, online teaching in place to kind of bulk up and, and make up for that loss. So any chance you have to diversify your income streams, even if it's diversifying within different print on demand companies. So like not only selling just through Society6, but also selling through, you know, Redbubble, um, Mixed Styles, Case Defy, whichever one, other ones you want to get involved with. So yeah, that was a long answer to your question. No, but it's a great one because we. I was going to ask you about how your lifestyle and your business was affected in 2020. I mean, every everyone I knew um, as artists were affected in one way or the other because we all license our work, right? But um, my question was, how what did you do to pivot? And you just answered that, that question beautifully. 
So someone asked about copywriting your work. So um, have you had any of your art stolen or copied in the past? And if so, how did you overcome the situation? Yeah, okay, so this happens all the time. Uh, I mean, every single day there's going to be some new product on eBay or Etsy or Amazon that has my artwork on it that they're not asking my permission, they're stealing it. And it's, it's part of putting your artwork out there for the world to see. So that's, it's, it's going to happen to you. If it hasn't happened yet and you have your artwork out there, it's, it's only a matter of time before that, that becomes a problem. But uh, there are things you can do about it. So if it's an online shop um, like Etsy or if it's any product that's being sold on a website, you can do something called filing a DMCA takedown request. So it's a long acronym. It's digital something, something, something. DMCA takedown. And so what that does is you can file this request and then within oh, 24, 48 hours, that page will be removed from the internet. So that is, if you just need to get something removed ASAP, um, you can file that request and it's going to get removed. But, you know, that company could easily just put it back up again. So you can take things a step further and file a cease and desist, which I do as well. Um, I have my, um, I have an intellectual property attorney now because I've, I've dealt with so so many of these at this point obviously if you're watching this you probably don't have your own attorney that like that just handles intellectual property lawsuits but um you can you can also file uh i'm sorry you can download cease and desist online you can just google it and get a template and kind of plug in the info and honestly that usually scares companies away as well so that does it for me and if it's um if it is like a, a brick and mortar store in the us or europe then and, it, and they're selling my work without my permission and it's like a big store then that is a total jackpot for me because that means that i'm going to stick my attorney on them and you know demand retribution so most of the stuff that gets stolen is just crappy online shops that are using artists work without their permission because honestly most of the time they get away with it but on the few occasions that an actual store sell uh, starts selling my work without my permission then i'm really gonna come down hard and sick my attorney on them and on the few times that's happened, uh, my best advice for you, if this ever does happen, don't be bummed out about it. Like hire a good intellectual property attorney immediately. Um, sometimes they'll do free consultations. So my first consultation was with mine, she actually did it for free. Um, and it was just, it was like a 30 minute call and I just basically laid out what happened. I told her how I drove to the store. Somebody notified me on Twitter. I always find out through Twitter. So yeah, somebody notified me through Twitter. It was actually a store that was in Kansas City as well. It was all over the United States. And so what I did is I drove to the store and then bought all the products that had my artwork on it and then had this call with, a, with an attorney. And she was like, you know what? Just come on by, drop off the products. And I did. And then she, she handled the rest. So in that particular case, I mean, my my legal fees were pretty expensive, but I was able to pay off my legal fees when all was said and done with the settlement money that I earned. You know, we're not going to take anything to court. Every company is going to want to settle. Um, but yeah, because we settled um, out, out of court, they wrote me a big check and half that check went to my attorney to pay for the fees. But it really taught me like you, you have legal recourse. And, you know, if it's if it's a tiny eBay seller. I'm probably not going to be able to earn anything off of that. But if it's a big store that has a, a lot of stores um, throughout the United States or Europe, then I can definitely uh, do something about it. But definitely hire an attorney. Don't try to handle it on your own. Because the first thing I did was like get on Twitter and be like, you guys stole my work. And then they just like immediately removed it from their online shop. And I was like, oh crap, I, I got to go like drive and pick it up. Otherwise, I'm going to have no evidence that they're even doing it. So don't bash them on social media until you absolutely have to. Yeah, I think you actually wrote a little bit about copywriting um, or how to copy your right um, on your um, website um, FAQ. So I'm just going to put that link into the comments so everyone can check it out. There's some really, really great um, information up on Kat's website. Like I was just stunned how much information that she's put up there. Any question you have, Anything that you need to know is all on Kat's websites, and she also even have a YouTube um, YouTube channel, and you have mm -hmm. uh, videos up there too. So you know you can find Kat on Skillshare, on YouTube, on her website, on Instagram. Everything is available. She's so open to sharing um, her knowledge and experience, and I really, really am very um, genuinely <laughs> grateful that you're here today. 
Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I, I am all about just being, you know, authentic and just telling it as it is. So I think, you know, as 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 artists, we have this opportunity now to be more open with each other and share this knowledge. And that's something that's really, I mean, that's never happened in the history of artists. I mean, artists always hold their cards close to their chest. And if something's working out well for them, they'll just not tell anybody and kind of and do that thing, which traditionally that that made sense. But now with the power of the internet, with social media, I mean, we're, we're living in a time where as open as we can be about our resources and what's working well, what's not working well, we're just, we'll all be able to rise together with that mentality. Yeah, right. We're going to move away from POD um, and I'm just going to put up a link of, um, this is one of the, like, I just enjoy watching this um, Skillshare class. I put the link up on um, the chat, sorry, my, my brain's not functioning really well at the moment. Kat, can you type in the Skype? chat and what is your latest tell us about your latest class on Skillshare yeah I just uh, published my 20th class yesterday and I'll throw it into the group chat um, okay I just dropped it in the chat so yeah it's my brand new class and it is a procreate class so procreate is an app that you can download on your iPad and then make these digital drawings and I just learned procreate at the end of 2019 when I got a new iPad and I, I mean, I was just like, why didn't I not start doing this sooner? It's the best art app ever. But um, yeah, so it's, this is actually, I think it's my fifth Procreate class. And so what it teaches you is how to draw your dream home in Procreate. So you learn how to use reference photos, um, kind of use those as a frame of reference and create, you know, a really unique home that's suited to uh I guess whatever is your dream home. So the one that I do in the class is I show you how I'm drawing this beach bungalow with po tropical palm trees. But I was going through the student projects uh, earlier today and I'm seeing a lot of nice variety. So people are doing um, all these different types of homes drawing on their iPad and it's really cool to see. Erin um, is asking, how much time does it take to develop a um, Skillshare teaching video? Oh man, okay, so it takes me, okay, the way that I put videos together is probably completely different from how another teacher does it. So I'm just gonna walk you through my process, but just know that this is not the only way to put together a class. Okay, so caveat aside. So when I'm putting together a class, what I do is I first um, kind of brainstorm a bunch of ideas of what I actually wanna teach. Uh, for me, I usually get on social media, like on Instagram, and I'm like, okay, here are my three ideas of what I think I might teach in my next class vote A, B, or C, which one you actually want to learn. And so it's it's a really good way to actually crowdsource and hear directly from my audience what they want to learn from me. Um, if you don't have a massive audience, that's it's not a necessary step. You can actually just get on Skillshare and then look and see what really popular classes are and then see if there's a way that you can um, kind of utilize that, that trending um, kind of topic of classes, but then add your own spin to it. So. You know, I put together a class on how to draw a house in Procreate, and there's probably, I mean, probably a hundred different Procreate classes on Skillshare right now. But what I'm bringing to the table is I'm teaching something that hasn't been taught yet. It's architectural drawings. And it's also coming from my own unique voice as a teacher. So those are two things that I can bring to the table that nobody else can do. Um, nobody else can be me teaching, just like nobody can be you teaching as well. So. You know, I've done seamless patterns before and uh, there's a lot of classes on seamless patterns, but no one's going to teach it in the exact way I teach it. So you always have value that you can bring to the table. Okay, but when I'm putting a class together, what I do first is I research what that class is actually going to be. And so I'll get on the platform, make sure it's not like too oversaturated. It's still a class that's, that's needed on that platform. Um, and then two, I'll start putting together an outline. So with Skillshare specifically, uh, they, the way that they structure their classes is everything is broken down into short videos. So uh, one of my classes might be maybe an hour and a half in total, but each little video lesson is only like two or five minutes. So it's little chunks at a time. So it makes learning um, a lot less overwhelming and kind of easier to pace yourself as you go. So. What I'll do is I'll put together an outline and I'll write like intro and I'll kind of hit the bullet points of the things that I want to mention in an intro. And then two might be, you know, prepping my art supplies and I'll mention the supplies I'm using. So it's, it's all these bite-sized chunks into separate videos. And then three might be, um, this is how I prep my canvas to get started. Four might be a sketch, you know, and so forth. So it's basically thinking of 
um, your entire process of whatever it is you want to teach and then breaking it down into really simple steps and then just explaining that one bit at a time, which actually it makes it easier for me as a teacher to do as well because if someone was like, okay, sit down and film an entire class on watercoloring, I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even know where to start with that. So it, it helps me uh, figure out how I'm going to teach it um, in a way that's going to resonate with my students as well. Yeah. Have you done a, a class about Skillshare on Skillshare? Oh my God, that's a fan, a, a very meta. I love it. I probably should actually. I mean, if you're if you're at all interested in teaching online, this is a really, really good time to get involved with online education. So, you know, I mentioned Society6 back in 2014 was the golden time. Uh, right now, online education, this is the golden time. So if you ever want to get involved with online teaching, now is the perfect time to do it because so many people are just are watching this content right now and it's not yet too oversaturated with content creators like me one because there's a bigger barrier to entry you know it's it's fairly easy to paint something and then put it up on society six um, but it's a lot harder to put together an entire class and have it on skillshare so if you have the um you know the gumption and the ability to put something like that together this is this is the time to do that yeah absolutely um, how many income streams do you have and do you think it's important for an artist to have more than one source of income? Yeah, um, income streams right now. So art licensing is one, uh, which my agency handles on my behalf. Uh, print on demand is another. And the reason I separate those two is because art licensing is that stuff like in-store, that's new collaborations, collections, and then print on demand is like Society6, Redbubble, all that jazz. So those are two. Um, a third one is online teaching through Skillshare. And then four is one that I just recently got into and it's hosting retreats around the world, um, which is completely brand new to me. I'm really excited for it. So my first one is actually happening this autumn in France. And I think it's, it's September, so it's, it's a week in France learning how to watercolor and then also learning business skills. So actually at this point, I gotta check real quick. Yeah, okay, there's five spots left. So we're um, allowing 16 people to come. There's five spots left. So if that's something you're interested in, watercoloring every day and then learning about growing your creative business, then um, it should, uh, should be a fun time. Okay, and I also found this YouTube video that you did with Logan. Logan Elliott is who you're partnering with to do this um, retreat, right? So yeah, we went on full stalker mode on cat <laughs> uh, recently and um, saw this video and you know, there were so many questions that I couldn't fit in this call and if you have more questions, um, there are so so many great things that Kat said on this YouTube video so I'll put it on the chat so everyone can um, hear it or watch that later on but yeah feel free to go on to YouTube and um, check out what Kat has up there um, and yeah, also this video is going to be up there too right? Yeah, this video is going up on YouTube as well. So the call that you just mentioned, it was a Zoom call that we did and we recorded it and then put it on YouTube. So the first half of that call was a webinar where we talk about this creative business accelerator that he's putting on that I'm actually going to be guest hosting a few of the sessions. And then the second half of that call, we just did a live Q&A. So it was similar to this where people just typed in questions and we took turns answering them. So um, the accelerator already started, so it might not be relevant to you to learn about the entire accelerator. But if you skip to like maybe skip the first 30 minutes and then go to the second part of that call, you'll be able to see that live Q&A portion. Yeah, um, we are, we have about 10 minutes left with the cat. Uh, till the end of this call so if you have any more questions for Kat please feel free to go in the comments um, I can't guarantee I'll quest, um, ask all of them just because we do have a limited time at the moment so I wanted to know let's talk about pricing should artists charge more for their work in general probably yes so the main thing I see across the board with artists is um, it's undervaluing what you're selling. And a lot of that, I, I get why, I get why you do it. I've definitely done that in the past as well, where I lowball my prices because I really want this gig to work out. Like I really want this contract to work out or I really want uh, this freelance opportunity to work out. But uh, I do it instead of just coming up with a, a random number now, um, which is what I definitely used to do, which don't do that. Uh, I, I kind of go about pricing a few different ways right now. So the first thing I do is I will Google it and find the answer. So 
If you're a freelance designer in Chicago, if I were you, I would Google um, hourly rate of freelance designer in Chicago with five years experience and then just see what that number is. And that at least in that way, you'll get a ballpark idea of what the average person is charging. And so you can Google average royalty rate of print on demand company and you'll see it's probably going to say 10 percent and so the more uh the more knowledge you have before you get it before you start you know throwing prices out the better you're going to be um, another thing that i do with pricing is sometimes like every once in a while i'll have an opportunity to uh, do a cool design job or license something out and it's something that I haven't exactly done in that like exact specific scope before. Like if someone's like, oh, I want to in-store license this on t-shirts, I'll be like, okay, cool. That's going to be a 7% royalty rate or whatever. But if it's something like um, a, a completely new gig, like I did some murals a few years ago for um, a, it was like a, a chain of real estate and they wanted a bunch of murals and a lot of their, a lot of their stores. And so it wasn't something that was going to be licensed. So it's not like I could be like, oh, give me 10% because it was just going to, it's a mural. It's just going to live there. And it was something that I was designing on my computer and sending off to them and they were printing out and putting up on all their, all their facilities. And so what I did instead is I, I emailed the client and I'm like, great. Um, I'd love to know your budget for this. Uh, just give me, give me a ballpark. And so rather than me just coming up with a mural price out of thin air, I got them to tell me their numbers first. And, and to be totally honest, I was thinking like, okay, maybe I'll charge like, I don't know, like $2,000 per mural. Like it, it wasn't like a massive amount of, of work for me. I could probably, you know, knock it off in an afternoon. But then um, when they came back to me, they're like, okay, well, our budget is, um, I think, oh God, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think it was like, 2,500 per mural or maybe 5,000 per mural. And I was just like, yep, okay, well, we'll go ahead and go with those numbers. That sounds fantastic. Even though, cause I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I asked, you know, and got, and got their, you know, their take first. Otherwise I completely would have undervalued myself and lost out on a ton of money. So it's, it's not a bad idea if you're working with a client one-on-one -on -one to just ask them first, like, great, I'd love to know your budget for this project. And then I'll, you know, run the scope on my end and see, see how it, how, if we can make this work or not and really put the ball in their court first. Yeah, absolutely. We are hitting the 1030 mark. So it is an hour. <laughs> I, can I just ask you one last question for all of Yeah, of course. And I want to know, what do you wish you knew um, when you first started out what you know now as an artist? Oh man, so many things. Okay. Um, I wish I would have gotten started earlier. I really lacked the confidence to share my art publicly until, until I did in 2014. I have been painting with watercolors, I mean, since I was a little kid, throughout college, throughout, you know, being an intern, throughout my career as, a, as an art director. And I just did it on the side when I got home from work or got home from class or whatever it was. But I, I never thought that this is something that I'm going to share publicly. It was kind of this private, this private thing that I was doing. And so at one point, I think I just snapped a picture with my phone and posted it to Instagram. And um, I, I built up confidence that way. So that was me getting over this, um, you know, inferiority complex of thinking I'm not good enough to be an artist and kind of dabbling, you know, testing the waters and getting used to it. So um, I wish I would have gotten started earlier. I wish I would have quit my full-time job earlier. I wish I would have quit my full-time job as soon as I was earning more money through that job than I was, um, or sorry, earning more money through print on demand than I was at my full-time job. I, I probably should have quit, but I think I stayed there for like an extra year and a half or two years because I was too I was just too scared to quit and be an entrepreneur. The idea of being self-employed was terrifying. So I should have I should have quit earlier, um, and and not just like quit your job tomorrow. But if you're seeing like if you if you found a way to make money and you see that that has the opportunity to to grow or sustain you, like maybe that is something to consider. Um, I wish I would have hired a CPA to help me with my taxes in that first year. Or as soon as I was earning, I don't know, an extra $2,000 a month on the side, I probably should have talked to a CPA because that first year doing my taxes was a complete nightmare because I owed so much money to the, uh, to the government because, you know, when you, when you have a job and you have an employer, there, you know, you have, you have payroll, you, have, you get paychecks every month and your taxes are taken out of that. But when you're earning money through Society6, they're not taking the taxes out of that. They're just giving you, the, that's, that's your responsibility to do. So I, I didn't really know that because I, 
I just, I just don't know that much about finance. I mean, I've learned a lot in the years since, but um, I wish I would have known how much I was going to have to pay in taxes for the amount of money I was earning. Um, I wish that I would have been more cautious about contracts I was signing. I was lucky that I didn't run into any terrible issues like the copyright transfer thing that I talked about earlier, but I, I easily could have, you know, I, I didn't read contracts as well as I should have because I didn't really know what to look for. So I wish that I would have, I don't know, spent an afternoon researching online what to look for in an art licensing contract and what is a red flag and what's a good thing to look for. Instead, I, I was a little bit cavalier about it. Thank God it, it, it turned out well, but it easily could have gone the wrong way. Um, and then probably one more thing is I wish that I would have started building my email list earlier, even though I wasn't, I didn't really start sending out emails, um, until last year. Uh, but email, I mean, social media, Instagram, they could disable my account tomorrow if they wanted to. I, I really have no ownership over that. Uh, Skillshare could ban all my classes tomorrow. I mean, I don't think they're going to, but I have no control over that. But emails are one thing that I, I once you you know have someone give you their email with the permission to use it, you that's something that is a really good and valuable asset for you because any time that you want to utilize that email list and sell something or uh, direct your audience to go you know, check out new products that you put together or an online class you have or share some freebies or insights or whatever it is, that's, that's something nobody can take those emails away from you. That's something that you actually have a little bit more ownership and stability with than your Instagram account, which could be gone tomorrow. Yeah. And in your society, six is kind of like a borrowed thing to rate bubble. They, those companies should just, should just disappear overnight and you, you leave you with nothing. So yes, I think email list is a great thing to have. Yeah, or, or the companies could decide that they don't want to promote your, they, they're going in a different direction and a design that used to be making you, you know, like maybe 500 bucks a month, if, I mean, that could be amazing. Maybe that design isn't featured in the same way it used to be featured and all of a sudden you've lost that, that income. I mean, that's what I mean when I say the control thing, like you don't have a lot of control over those decisions. Of course, I love working with Society6, Skillshare, all these partners, but, um, it's also, you know, the relationship we have is I don't pull the strings with their company and they don't pull the strings with my company. So, um, yeah, it's there's there's always risks involved. Yep. And with that, we say thank you for your time. Thank you so much for coming on this Facebook group and answering all our questions. And, you know, you've been really amazing. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really, I really enjoyed this. All right, so we're gonna say bye everyone. Thank you for being here. You've been really responsive and engaging. Um, if you have any questions for Kat and I, maybe she might stick around on the Facebook group and answer them, but otherwise, lots of information on her website, her YouTube, her um, Instagram is, is amazing. So check those out and obviously her Skillshare class. Thanks Kat again. Have a great day everyone. See ya. Thank you so much.